When the time came, though, in 2004, and um, states were not successful in solving their disputes bilaterally by then, Greece backed off and did not um, take things to The Hague, as it could have done, because the government at the time um, of, of new democracy, again, um, was um, very much afraid that, um, that The Hague would not um, yield results expected. So effectively, that blew a huge gap in, um, in, in Greek foreign policy because it lost one of the cornerstones of its um, uh, discourse until then. However, since 2004, and, 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 and given um, the, the position of the two countries, things were very flat. No ups, no downs, very few things. And suddenly, we start drilling in the southeast Mediterranean, and surprise, surprise, um, the possibility of natural resources surfaces. If I'm not mistaken, the, um, um, the, the, the CIA report um, said that 133 trillion tons of natural gas um, are to be found in the southeastern Mediterranean. Noble Energy, the American company um, licensed by the Israelis and, uh, and the Republic of Cyprus um, to drill, has already come up with 22 um, trillion tons, but still. So effectively, again, what we had in 1973 surfaced. In 1973, oil crisis, the possibility of oil reserves in the Aegean drove the countries nuts. Now, same thing in the southeastern Mediterranean with the possibility of natural gas and oil. And this sparked the discussion regarding the possibility of relooking at the Aegean, seabed and subsoil. And not only that, but taking things a step further, introducing not only continental shelf as such, but exclusive economic zone discussion. This, I submit, is a very hasty move. And it is done by whoever it is done for either of two reasons. Either reasons of political expediency, or reasons of a very limited understanding of the technical and legal um, repercussions of that. So brief question, EZ, Exclusive Economic Zone, or Continental Shelf? What are the provisions, guarantees, um, rights and duties pertaining to each? Let me summarize, if I may, um, this with regard to the Aegean and to, to an extent to the southeast Mediterranean more broadly, by way of introducing four questions. One, what is Greece losing by not introducing an exclusive economic zone? Or, conversely, what would a possible proclamation of an exclusive economic zone bring to Greece? What would it offer? Second, if Greece declares an exclusive economic zone without a solution to the Aegean disputes, could it proceed with the exploration and exploitation of the natural resources if such deposits were to be found? Third, would the proclamation of an EZ solve once and for all Turkish-Greek disputes in the Aegean? including, of course, territorial sea, continental shelves, and this and that. And fourth, what would the preferred mechanism be for the solution and dispute settlement of bilateral disputes in the Aegean? In principle, supporters of the EZ regime, especially in Greece, say that um, it would be very important for Greece to declare an exclusive economic zone, because it would introduce the unity of the Greek space, both insular and continental, which is definitely well established in international law. It would allow for controlling of overfishing activities beyond the six nautical miles of territorial sea, as things stand at the moment. It would allow the state to potentially engage in um, energy production from the superjacent air, through turbines, and it would allow the state to better maintain and preserve the marine environment. This is a very one-sided approach to things. Let me explain why. First of all, exclusive economic zone 
introduces rights which are sovereign rights for the state, in other words, exclusive rights of exploration and exploitation, but it does not amount to sovereignty. It is crucial to understand that because in the public discourse is not always very clear, that there is no nexus to sovereignty of any definition. It's not as if the state expands its sovereignty geographically. The exclusive economic zone, compared to the continental shelf, introduces only three, very specifically, three further kinds of rights in addition to those offered by the continental shelf, um, legally speaking. One, it allows the state to engage exclusively in fishing in that area. It allows the state, and of course it obliges the state, to protect the marine environment in that area. And thirdly, it allows for the production of um, energy through air, through turbines. That's it. This is an exhaustive list, which according to the law of the Sea Convention, um, does not allow for any further rights. So effectively, what I mean to say is that if it is only hydrocarbons we're after, if it is only natural gas and oil we're after, then the continental shelf is enough. We don't need the exclusive economic zone. Always hydrocarbons, gas and oil are located on the continental shelf, in other words, only on the seabed and subsoil of the submarine areas that are adjacent to the coast but outside the territorial sea. So effectively, the ease at discussion is disorienting. Further, such rights are, need, are in need of, 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 of being um, exercised with due regard, according to the law of the Sea Convention, to other states' rights existing in the area. In other words, although the continental shelf regime introduces rights for the states, which we call ipso facto, in the sense that rights pertaining to the state by virtue of being a coastal state, and these rights exist for the state whether it decides to use them or not, the exclusive economic zone introduces rights only if it is declared. Okay. The exclusive economic zone is a much younger concept and a much more uncertain concept because it only came about in the new law of the Sea Convention um, in uh, the 1970s. Um, the convention, you might recall, was um, assigned in 1982 and was ratified only in 1994. So it's, it's a very new rights we're talking about and thus are um, not as well established as the rights of continental shelf. So the continental shelf, the, the exclusive economic zone's philosophy, if you like, is very different from that of the continental shelf, and then originally it was introduced to limit the excessive claims of states like Latin American states, which um, not having any other state in front of them but, but just the open ocean, wanted to extend their territorial seas to 200 nautical miles with um, um, all the, um, the um, <coughs> um, outcomes that, that this would entail. So effectively, this whole discussion regarding the exclusive economic zone is um, extremely disorienting um, and has absolutely no relevance if we talk only about gas and oil. If the state wanted to, to engage indeed in exclusive fisheries and production of, air, of energy and this and that, yes, then we might. But pertaining to, to, to the oil and gas, there's absolutely no reason why to talk about this. Further, rather than solving problems, it would introduce a new host of problems that perhaps in the case of the Aegean would further aggravate the dispute rather than um, solve it. Again, the exclusive economic zone needs to be declared formally. However, the law of the Sea Convention is very clear that the right to proclaim does not equal the right to explore and exploit, which means that any country could proclaim a continental shelf, uh, a, sorry, um, an exclusive economic zone, if there were no problems with other states around. However, in order to proceed with exploration and exploitation of the natural resources, it needs to, it is legally bound, to delimit it first with other states. 
So in this respect, it's not like the continental shelf whereby a state proclaims it. If it wishes to use it, it does. If it doesn't, otherwise it grants licenses to foreign companies to do so and all. There is no need in that case for any states to have an agreement. Here there is an obligation to do so. So in this respect, all this discussion about unilateral proclamations of EZ and all does not have legal uh, footing because any country would have to come and, and, and delimit it. And delimit according to the convention, which means uh, first by negotiation and agreement, and if that fails within uh, um, a logical period of time, then recourse to one of the mechanisms envisaged in the convention. There are 22 mechanisms, such as um, judicial, um, arbitral, uh, tribunals and the like. This is exactly why the Republic of Cyprus proceeded um, with um, bilateral delimitation agreements of the EEZ with Israel, with Lebanon and with Egypt because it knows very well that it could not grant licenses for the exploration until it had such a delimitation. Now, of course, in the southeastern Mediterranean we're talking about only areas to the, to the south and southeast of the island of Cyprus. This is where delimitation agreements are in place with the other states. Because to the north, um, northeast and northwest, we have a different story with um, uh, Turkey's presence. In that case, Turkey has actually been playing um, diff two different positions, um, having to do with um, the rights of Turkish Cypriots uh, in any possible agreement, the, the perhaps the percentage of gains that they would be entitled to um, if a delimitation agreement um, um, yielded exploration, concrete exploration, exploitation activities, to the point of arguing that Turkey itself um, should be part of the negotiations because some of the areas <coughs> potentially could, um, could be overlapping with uh, to what um, uh, Turkey declares to be its, its, um, its own continental shelf. Now, final point regarding exclusive economic zones. Yes, the legal argument is one, but of course political balancing is another. I mean to say two things here. First of all, the fact that certain areas are entitled to rights in the sea is one discussion and what kind of rights delimitation wise they're entitled to is another. In plainer words the fact that states have in principle certain rights to establish maritime zones is not prejudicial to what kind of delimitation will um, will um, be affected in the end. So for instance, the fact that an island in principle generates, has the right to generate maritime zones, does not necessarily mean that this is going to have a full effect, as we say. In other words, this right finding its way into a, a <clears throat> full acceptance in any possible delimitation. So effectively what I mean to say is that the fact that the geographical situation in the Aegean, spotted with islands here and there, um, introduces the right in principle of these areas to create, quote unquote, areas around them, exclusive economic zones, continental shelf and the right, is not necessarily going to materialize on the map. Because judicial organs until now, and I mean in 100% of the cases, 100%, not 99, 100% of the cases, adjudicated by the International Court of Justice and administrative tribunals of various kinds, have limited, um, have curtailed the rights of islands to, to the degree of perhaps the decisions being even illegal in this respect. So you can imagine that any possible delimitation of the Aegean dispute would yield results very different from what we have been um, um, <clears throat> believing um, until now. To give you a very small example, in a delimitation case between Malta and Libya, the International Court of Justice, for the purpose of delimitation, understood Malta as part of Italy, an independent sovereign state, affected a line, and then imagine what the situation would be in Cyprus. Why would Cyprus be different from Malta? It could again be taken as part of another state. This is an absurd um, um, legal construction, but it is real. Okay.